At Riot, we've always loved music. In fact, in certain countries, people don't call us a game company. They call us a music company, and they say we're making games to do marketing for our music. And so, obviously, when we dived into a TV show, we knew music was going to be a big part of it. Music is obviously personal to Christian. It's personal to a lot of folks on that team. I think Alex Yee once said, when you go write a script, and I think it's the same thing with music, you know, when you go write a song, and you just sit down to do it, and someone asks you, oh, are you going to write a great song today? It's kind of like... It's kind of like going, you know, maybe, you know, it's kind of like going fishing, he said. I know what tools to use. I have experience to know where the best spots are. Welcome to the play. But whether or not I'm actually going to catch one. <laughs> We've worked on all kinds of genres at this point, and when Arcane came about, we said, hey, we're going to craft a full album of all these different songs, of all these different genres. It really was the culmination of all the different skill sets that we've developed over the many years on the music team uh, to craft something that's really unparalleled. I think it's time to say goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Welcome to my studio, North Hollywood. Uh, this is where we make some of the music for Arcane. Follow me. <laughs> so we were going for an incredibly messy aesthetic of gear everywhere. We don't invite people over. The, you're the first human beings I've seen or invited here in years. <laughs> we prefer dark, no windows. <laughs> I love this space so much. It's the first time I've been able to have like an actual piano. Um, I've got the most important instrument of them all, obviously. The French horn here. Everything I do is just French horn and then I'll just auto-tune it to sound like other instruments. It's a cool trick that I learned in school. Just kidding, I'm way in debt for my college loans. It's a sad story. <laughs> what made Seaver really, really special is that he's not only extremely talented at writing melodies, you know, for pop vocals, but also he's a classically trained musician. He went to Juilliard as a French horn player and when that career failed, um, he became a really successful pop artist. I've been working with Riot since about 2016. Each year for their Worlds event, the biggest esports tournament probably ever, we write an anthem for them, so like a big pop song. Legends Never Die was the first like Worlds anthem that I wrote. And about two and a half years ago, Christian reached out and he's like, what do you think about Arcane? Do you want to get involved? And I was just like, oh yes, please, this would be the sickest. We always wanted to make music part of the development from the very beginning instead of just this post-production phase, you know, that it often is in film and television. The first time I heard about Arcane was pretty much a series of index cards stuck to the acoustic treatment in Christian's composing room. Technically, he was still a composer then, but he had the story that he wanted to tell, and he had ideas for who he wanted to help him tell it. Our music on Arcane started with Alex Temple, who is just an incredible composer. But at that point, I hadn't done any longer form narrative work. I'd done shorter form narrative, whether it's like a three to five minute trailer or things like that, but nothing approaching the scope of Arcane. Can you tell me what this is? So this is a Um I might be pronouncing it slightly incorrectly, but uh, yeah, normally it's played, it has a pentatonic scale, um, and you can affect the pitch by, you know, bending over here. Um, I've been using it completely incorrectly, you know, playing the back side of the instrument. Or even sort of playing it with this singing bowl mallet. For the first few months, at least, we actually stayed away from any like picture material from the show, and we just explored themes in isolation for a character, every character. 
I think when working on a theme, you want something that clearly makes a statement about who this character is, but you also want something that's adaptable. So this is uh, the beginning of episode three. We have this Okamani that comes in. So for example, we have this character, Silco. You know, he's kind of one of the villains of the show. He's a complex character. He has good reasons for some of his motives, but he's, you know, he's sort of a villain. The music that I end up writing for him not sort of villainous at all. It's it's very sort of welcoming and kind of seductive in a way. Uh, so sometimes when we when we use these sort of motifs, they come back in kind of subtle ways. A very confused, distorted version of that uh, melody we heard performed so beautifully by the soprano in the other cue. We really wanted to have just melodies, you know, for characters. Like, really, like oh, you, you should feel like you remember this character in this moment when you hear this melody. They're always there, but sometimes they're darker, sometimes they're brighter, sometimes they're faster, but they're always there. Alex Temple, the lead composer, he's just such a god-tier orchestra composer, like to a level I can't get to. Uh, first violins at bar 13 can, can play that out a little more. Okay. Thanks. Uh, one, one more for luck, and then we'll move on. because I was a French horn player growing up, and so I listened to just all this Mahler and like Bruckner and all these people, and so I thought I was obsessed with it, and then I'd talk Mahler with him, and he's just like, oh, the specific recording of George Schulte from 1975, I prefer the third movement versus the Bernstein recording. And you're like, okay, <laughs> all right, you win the nerd contest. <laughs> So Ray Chen is a, a phenomenal violinist. You never know quite what it's going to be like working with, you know, somebody who's at the top of their field. Ray plays as a soloist with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the big orchestras in Europe, you know, London. He's probably the first classical violinist who plays on like a 20s, whatever million dollar Stradivarius to an animated series. He's got a lot of patience. A lot of the time, the music I put in front of him, it's written because we know he can play it. <laughs> I don't know about that. That's it. That was horrible. My God. <laughs> <laughs> We're approaching the finale of the first season. It's getting very dramatic for all of our characters. This is a cue that's based on the theme of the character Victor. This is around the time when, when he pushes his you know, body and the transformation further and further and kind of gets seduced in a way by this hex core and uh, starts to kind of lose parts of his humanity. And there's kind of like a, like, like a terrible beauty, if that makes sense. It's a really tragic moment, but it's also kind of a tragic ascendancy because it's like, it's not a good thing that's happening. But at the same time, this is kind of like a, a leveling up of the character. This is an important stage of his development. I've been doing orchestra stuff with Alex Temple for about two and a half years. 
and it was only about a year ago that we were like, let's do a, you know, 11, 12 song pop soundtrack to go with the show. There's a girl in town and words gonna run, she's just fine. We knew that we also wanted to create these special moments in every episode with music. And so with the editors and the directors of our team, we tried to find a moment where the music can actually take over and be in the spotlight. Working on Arcane, the pressure is pretty high. All these great, amazing artists, and the story is amazing, and the animation is amazing, the score is amazing, the, the, the sound is great, the music has to be good too, the songs have to be good. Sebastian is like the ultimate homie for me. Don't play with the misfits. We did Rise together, we did Awaken together. I cannot like wait to work with him any chance I get. Sebastian is this interesting character. I remember in his interview, we always asked him, like, what kind of song would you make with this character for, for that moment? And he was always just go, I don't know, I don't know. And so we were like, we don't know if he's the right guy for the job. And then you just start hearing the songs and all of a sudden you're just blown away. He's, he's the kind of person that just does, but doesn't talk about it. We call these the banger labs, where all, where all, the, where all the bangers are made. Well, um, we heard there's some music going on. So I had already worked on cinematics for Riot and music videos and things like that. But Arcane, the extra difficulty was that, you know, the, the purpose of the song is for a scene, is for the story. Who told you it was Unlike other movies and shows that might have just like a standalone incidental soundtrack of pop artists, we actually wrote these to picture the way that you would score something. I've seen your face around here. Come along, tell me under the table. What do you see? I know for Sebastian and myself, it was like really difficult to like figure out that language where we're getting things to feel like a song but also getting them to dodge between dialogue or like hit peak moments to picture which might not be happening at a set tempo. I think so much in what we do with the songs, you can kind of find parts of the world as well. Like Zon, this underground world, where a lot of things kind of get repurposed, reused, mangled, distorted. And that's what the drums kind of also tell me. Where I feel like, okay, if Jinx would design a kick drum, what would it sound like? When we worked with B. Miller, she had recorded some really amazing improvisations. Like this, this for example, is... She totally understood the vibe of what we were trying to convey, you know, descending into zone, and it just was perfect. My dream was that we could kind of write the songs early enough so we can even still edit, you know, sequences uh, and boards to the music. I think what we found pretty fast is that we would have these issues that we would approach all these artists and we'd say, oh, we want to make music with you, make these songs. And they'd say, oh, cool, that's awesome. When do they go out? And we would tell them, like, oh, in two years. And they would go, oh, never mind. You know, so what we did instead is to actually write the songs ourselves and then bring on the artist to kind of, like, you know, either just sing it or find their version of it. Wherever you are, light it up and I'll find you. <laughs> Funny enough, we didn't even initially think about Wood Kid for this song. We had him for a different one, and he happened to hear this demo and went, oh, let me do that one instead. <laughs> and it was the greatest thing that could have ever happened. This was like sort of an action-y piece when I had first written it, and then he turned it into the most chill-inducing string thing I've ever heard. Yeah, so like it, it always just starts here and then you never quite know what it's gonna end up being. Uh, the other big one was the uh, Jinx Echo fight <laughs> in episode seven. <laughs> Got that vibe figured out. 
And then for the vocalist, the rapper, they were like, okay, we have some ideas of who could be super cool. Like, okay, let, let's let's see what what can you know. Let's send the track to them and see if they want to do it. And also, you know, are they going to do something that that fits? You know, Denzel Curry was one one of them. In this gothic underground city, we all sin. If I bring a couple rounds with me, then we all win. Jizzle was another one. Just might kick your butt, go run the muck, then paint my nails. Never learn to raise my hand. Was too busy raising hell. And uh, Brent Joy, he sent us a demo that was kind of, sounded like a female vocal. I was like, oh, that's a really cool, catchy kind of chorus uh, part. Turns out it was him just pitched up. Oh yeah, he mad, I'm racking up white diamonds. Throw me in the sky, you will sweat the sun shining. All three sent us really awesome stuff. <laughs> so we got three demos, like, oh my God. We're like, what can we do? A little bit of a challenge just from having so much good material. How do we, uh, how do we make it in, how do we make three songs into one song? Let's try to use all three. <laughs> in this gothic underground city, we all sit. If I bring a couple rounds with me, then we all win. I came back and brought the crown That was one cool and challenging thing about uh, working on Arcane songs is you get these puzzles that you have to solve. Season one, everything we did for music was kind of happening then like after the, the cut, the episodes were already done. And so now if we do it early enough, yeah. we would have the ability for the artists to just kind of write whatever they want and then we can cut the episodes to it. I think it, 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 it was such a limitation for the, for the writing and musicians, you know? Working with Christian is pretty special because he's a musician. That's also another great thing about him is that he's not gonna waste time. If it's not great, he'll tell you. He'll tell you right away. Yeah, it's not working. Can you play the 57, just, just solo it real quick? I just wanna hear it because I don't know if the orchestra always makes me feel like it's more convoluted than what it actually is. Christian started his career at Riot in an entry level position, answering tickets when players have a problem, whether it's a technical problem or billing problems. Then only a couple years later, he started to write some music and, and only then we realized, oh my God, <laughs> this guy is an amazing talent. Christian, you know, the first time I met him, he came onto campus, very quiet, very unassuming, other than of course the neck tattoo. <laughs> and you know, I'm like, so, you know, tell me what jobs have you worked? What have you done prior to coming here? And he's like, oh, well, you know, uh, I, did, um, I did some music. You know, I was in a band. I traveled around Europe doing some tour kind of stuff. I was like, don't care. How well will you serve the players? It took me a little while to realize that he was, in fact, a big deal. I believe he told me the biggest audience he played in front of was like 100,000 people. Christian's a freak because he gives us feedback like, no, the cello needs to be an octave lower and it needs to be this dynamic. Like, he just knows how to speak music. That's <laughs> my favorite Christian feedback. <laughs> when I released my album, I had one song that I was like super into and I'm still really happy with it, but I just remember Christian was like, and Christian liked it when I was working on it. And then he heard the final, he's like, hmm, it sounds unfinished. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you gotta break them before we can build them up. Yeah. We're all so <laughs> broken. Like a Establish dependence. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to give us high fives and we flinch. <laughs> all right. We're all so broken. Ready? It's going, it's just the episode 8 track where he's gonna have to pivot. Um, it's the last song we had to come up with and this one was... The hardest one. Yeah. Really? The concept was... Uh, Ambitious. Was ambitious and hard to execute. <laughs> when you kind of go into it knowing like, by the way, this is the big champion moment for Vi and for Jace, and this needs to be great. And you just, you're gonna question every choice you make because it's like, but is it great? And so it's just, it's also just expectations are always really high. So this is a bit of a Hail Mary just to kind of say, hey, we, we're, we couldn't really figure it out. And so, um, Someone had recommended Paris, you know, just because she has a really cool sound. And then we just kind of went, maybe we should just let her do her thing. So this is like a demo they send over. And yeah, we, we were just kind of opening it up for the first time. That's 
pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Feels, feels like vibe, feels right. You know, her voice just feels like kind of something that vibe with the attitude is really, really fun. She even has like the shaved side and then like the nose ring. I was like, she kind of is vibe. Dan from Imagine Dragons, and this is our studio. This is where we did Enemy. So I'll take you on back. Well, hello, hello. Oh, hello there. This oh. is Daniel Platzman, our drummer. How's it going? Ben McKee, a bass player. Oh, fancy yeah. meeting you here. And okay. Wayne Sermon, uh, the guitarist. And this wasn't planned at all. I can't believe you guys are yeah. in here at this exact time. What are you so doing weird. here? I just felt like I needed to be here. Vi is actually the player that I play on League of Legends, so I definitely associated with it. Uh, and that was a question I had. Like, what yeah. do like, all of you play or some of you? Uh, the three of us play. So Platzman plays, Ben's a more old school gamer. Did you try League? Uh, I have tried League. It is, I am a simple man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, we've, pretty we've rough. Certainly been, we have definitely been uh, late on stage in front of I don't know, tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people because we were finishing a, a ranked League of Legends game yeah. and we didn't want to get banned. I love Riot. We've worked with them for a long time and we've been a part of the community for years. And I love Christian. We vibed out. He told me about what he'd been working on and showed me a lot of slides and storyboard. At that time, it was in the very early stages of our game. But it was enough that I understood the dynamic at play with, you know, the sisters and, and Vi and Jinx. <laughs> What makes you different makes you strong. You know, as far as enemy goes, I think there's a lot of times in people's lives where you just feel like uh, alone or you feel isolated. And that song is uh, written in isolation and feeling kind of you against the world. Searching to be home, stories in a tone. When my back was to the world, smiling when I turn. I mean, it goes without saying, like, the last scene of season one is probably gonna be an important scene. And it was this beautiful montage, and they had uh, tempted up with this, like, stunning David Bowie song. And they're like, you know, Alex, could you, <laughs> could you write us a song that fills this moment? And you're like, sure, I'm gonna have a panic attack first. Uh, I'm gonna go see my therapist, and then as soon as I center myself, try and write a song that lives up to that moment. So here's some of the uh, initial stems that I had done. It was just like a piano and my own vocal. I am the monster you created. You ripped out all my parts. The way it starts is just like a person just like lamenting. I mean, it was really Jinx's voice in this song. The lyrics for that one came quickly. The difficulty with that was writing a song that's structured properly. Because Jinx fires this rocket at first. Which is like a beautiful moment as it soars across the sky. And I wasn't at the point in the song that something that big was supposed to happen yet. So we had to like figure out how to write almost like a bridge section that is this rocket blast moment before we get back to the second verse and before we continue the song. 
Christian would give us feedback and we'd kind of hit our stride and then it would be like, okay, which artists do we want to have sing this? Sting was at the top of our list. I mean, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty convenient to be like, oh, we'd love to have Sting. Like, oh yeah, would you? <laughs> but we we had him there and we were able to talk to him about it and get him into it and show him the sequence. And he was just really generous and it did exactly what we had hoped, which is just elevate it into this moment that is kind of above everything else. Like when you hear Sting's voice enter, you're just like, is that Sting? <laughs> What could have been? You know, it's funny because you work on these moments for so long until you actually, like, when you think, oh my God, this is going to be amazing. But you just don't quite know until you actually see everything done. And you just have that feeling for like two or three years where you go, I think it's going to be amazing, but I'm not quite sure. And you just kind of have to wait because you just, you know, does the music come together? Does it have that kind of magical touch, you know, like, does the storytelling come together, does the acting kind of come together? We're bleeding money, and for what? His dreams of rebellion is losing control. I'm curious to see how it will go when this show hits all the platforms so people come watch it and it's released and how, how it'll go for our league audience, you know, and also kind of like the general audience. A league audience, they will certainly tell us how they feel changes the emotion but all i really hear is just a it's pretty scary to know that you're working on something that really cannot fail you know like it's not that's not an option and so you, it just makes you question everything <laughs>